Hey everyone, welcome to another Developer Brunch. Today I'm very excited to be speaking with Chet Falasek from Stray Bombay, CEO. How's it going, sir? Good. And and good job on the name, as you just said. Yeah, very, <laughs> very, very well done. Yeah, well, good job on uh, releasing the Atacrucis. We've been playing it a little bit for the past week and uh, it's very exciting to see it come out. Uh, how does it feel now that, you know, it's out there and people are actually playing it? Yeah, no, it, it feels great. I mean, our our... Thing always was is wanting to get the game into people's hands as soon as we could and then it becomes a question of is um when's too early when's too late how's too little content how's too much content wanting really to give people the understanding the feeling that hey um we are really going to change and update this and listen to the community um you know it's just something we've I've always um, projects i've worked on done a version of that but just really wanted to dive deep into that kind of uh, development yeah, awesome. Today, I do want to talk about sort of your illustrious past and you forming this new company and how it's led to the Anacrusis. So let's just start. Uh, for those who don't know, which maybe some of these viewers, you worked at Valve for 12 or so years. 12 years. Uh, yeah, working on some of the biggest games uh, that they released, uh, doing a lot of narrative and I'm sure a lot of other things too, because Valve is, you know, in the grand scheme of things, a smaller team than most people expect. Um, what did it feel like after being at this monolithic company for so long to step out on your own um i mean definitely kind of uh, you know some odd some strange so when i left valve it was um totally um there's no animosity or and any like negative reason why just after 12 years of being there i wanted to get back into getting my hands dirty making games and i had at that point been doing um like vr outreach developer outreach for so long that it just didn't feel like that it was the same anymore and so i might as well if i'm going to do that think of trying to start this on my own and it, you know starting from zero is interesting starting like our discord or doing streaming and just starting from you know that first time somebody joins to everything is just a very different feeling than you know at valve where you start the love for dead twitter account and the next day you know there's like you know a gajillion followers and um all that kind of thing yeah and you know valve is kind of known as this black box um you know a lot of stuff's happening there and there's all you know as you said there's a, a bajillion people following and getting into leaks and nitty-gritty and theories and stuff so you know what was it like being in that black box and then working on something like the anacrusis where you've been very sort of since the announcement open and bringing in your community to help you test it like was that really liberating for you well, I mean, even at Valve, I was often the one probably breaking the rules on the black box and talking more <laughs> to the community than other people, right? Yeah. That was that was kind of my role often. Um, so I was kind of used to it that way. Um, this is a little different about probably being just a little bit rougher in our start and want to kind of jump into that. But you know, I always I've always interacted with the community in a way that I think players are really smart and while they won't tell you the solution, they'll tell you the problems clearly and express kind of what their desires are. And you just have to balance that then with, you know, what are your overall goals for the game? Is this the right community? Like we didn't want to do a closed beta because we thought a closed beta attracts a group of people who want to be in closed betas mm -hmm. versus just your common everyday player. And that common everyday player is more of kind of what this game is going to be built for. And so how do we, you know, how do we attract them when we, we do it in early access? And so, you know, in some ways, this was not very different. I mean, I just remember, like, at Valve, I would wake up every morning a lot of times just saying, like, don't be the leak, don't be the leak, don't be the leak, <laughs> and especially around VR, because we were very quiet for VR for, you know, I would say there's probably a year where people had no idea why I was going to all these VR events and hanging out, and then, you know, we announced it at GDC, and all of a sudden, everyone's like, oh, yeah, now this makes sense. Yeah, I remember we, uh, at Fellow Traveler, I was, we were working on a VR game for a long time for Oculus, and you know, be hearing these whispers around Valve was like, what's going on? What's happening? And then, you know, Vive came out like, oh, okay, that's what's been going on behind the scenes. So yeah, pretty cool stuff. Yeah, that, that was that was a fun launch to be a part of. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you you leave Valve, you join Bossa, Bossa Games, who are based in London, I believe. Um, Correct. So that obviously didn't work out, uh, but I am interested is... The core of the Anacrusis, was that started at Bossa or is this a completely different project? No, th that was an entirely different game. Right. right. Um, yeah, I had known Enrique and Emery for a really long time. And um, the third founder, Roberta, I, I knew a little less well just because I 
probably went to dinner with the other two so much. I was just, it was often that thing of, you know, I was working at Valve. If I'm going to go to London, I'm going to go visit those guys. Mm-hmm. And at that point, um, I went to London a lot um, for a lot of reasons. And so just had really been good friends with them and wanted to see if we could work something out. You know, I just don't think I was a good fit for the studio and the kind of games that they really excel at. Yeah. I think they were probably trying to stretch to some different games. And what they really excel at, like they did the, you know, I Am Fish just recently released. And that's like their wheelhouse of that quirky mm-hmm. kind of cool like funky fun uh game they've got some new stuff coming out like they're experimental in this other way than i am mm-hmm. and so um yeah so after a year we talked about it and just wasn't a good fit and um yeah oh uh, yeah it sucked because uh, it's friends that i wish it could have worked out with and you know i still keep in touch and still chat with them so yeah you know yeah now that's understandable and you know just sometimes that happens as you said but um obviously stray bombay you've you've been very vocal uh your whole team has been pretty vocal about you know the anacrusis is a social game um so i wanted to sort of dive into that a little bit like i've i've watched a few other interviews with you where you've i think you're right the social game has this sort of stigma of oh, it's farmville it's what <laughs> yes. your mum plays on facebook right and uh I guess from my perspective, what you're really trying to say, I think, is that uh, the Anacrusis is not a game as a service, which is what the industry is heading towards. Would you agree with that or? Well, no. So I, I don't define those two as being independent ideas. Mm-hmm. Like games as a service to me is constantly being updated, being worked on. Um, like we will have updates for years coming mm-hmm. from this. We're like, we're not like just trying to get to 1.0 and then we walk away from it. This is like a constantly evolving story in world and interacting with the community for um, not just playing the game, but also creating content around the game. So in that case, it's very definitely games as a service, but it's more, we're not trying to make this lifestyle game that you've got to grind at every single day because, oh my God, the only way to get the drops every week is to play every single day for four hours a day. Mm -hmm. I'm more older, we're more senior developers. And so this is the game you play around that. This is the game you play, you know, once a week, or twice a week with some friends from college, or you just want to hook up with some, meet some new people. You know, one of the amazing things to me in Love for Dead was how many people told me they met their partner when playing that game and got <laughs> married. Yeah, right. Um, and it was just that kind of game because it gave you these downtime where you could talk, it let you stop and plan things. I mean, sometimes if you look at like the average play sessions of those games, you know, people just stop during one of the um, crescendo events where you can control the pacing and not have anything happen. And they just sat there and hung out and talked. Yeah, right. Right. And so wanted to make sure that we had a game that had that kind of personality to it and that kind of space for players. So there's players who will play the game and kind of have their reasons for playing it. And there are other people who just chill and hang out with friends and play it that way. Right. And Mm so I often think of when you make a game, it's like this ball that you want to have a lot of different ways to grasp. Um, There's like the the concept of the seven um, ideas of fun. Yep. And it's like, making sure you're encapsulating a lot of those different ones in different ways for people. Cause sometimes it is just the mastery of the simplicity of something that just is fun to do. Um, and sometimes it's the challenge and sometimes it's the experience. Sometimes it's the social side and just giving people a bunch of different ways to grasp onto it, I think is important. Yeah. I think the thing that really uh, struck me while playing the Anacrusis is that fact that it's not trying to be the only game in my life. Right. Which as you said, that's, I really appreciate that, but there still is that skill ceiling. There still is that, oh, okay, if I really actually want to get into this, I can learn how the perks really work well together. And then hopefully the the director or the driver or whatever that you're calling that uh, AI system is going to keep me on my toes, right? Um, I, I was listening that originally, uh, I think I was listening to an interview with Will Smith uh, talking about how the perk system wasn't, was kind of not in the game for a long time. And then you guys kind of dropped it in. So I, uh, has the development cycle sort of been that that iterative throw a bunch of ideas at the wall and see what really sticks and then build on that? Or have you gone in with sort of a basic plan? Yes to both. <laughs> um, so it was depending on the stage, right? So a lot of times it'd be like, yes, we want to do all these crazy things, but let's first get the game up to this level so that we have this understanding. You know what it is? Like starting from zero, you need to lock some things down. Yeah, yeah, for you sure. You need to say... Like, hey, our movement's going to be like this. Okay, if our movement's like this, then we can create enemies that deal with that. You don't have, like, all of these things moving at once. You have to start anchoring things down and going, okay, this is, to this level, we're going to bring the weapons, and then the perks will come later, and we know we're going to do perks. We will investigate perks later. And this was really um, a way of developing to do a lot of things very quickly that we really did a lot of in Left 4 Dead 2, actually, 
So we did Love for Dead 2 in a year. And everyone's always like, oh, Val's so slow. And it's like, well, no, what we did was <laughs> we were really fastidious about, we we're going to do experiments on Melee. But we are not going to do experiments on Melee until like month four. Mm -hmm. It's really hard because that first month you're like, I want to do Melee. And you're like, no, 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 we will get to that. But we need to lay the groundwork for it first and then it'll come. And that's really the kind of way we approach this here. We always kind of had this roadmap of these are the things we're going to go get to. Perks have been there from day one. Yeah. But what they look like, how they behave, what we need, we don't know yet. We first need to know the weapon, the enemies we're going to be fighting and the weapons that we have to fight them. And then we can start understanding the perks because we just knew we wanted to avoid the, I have 10% more this, 10% this qu is quicker, and like those kind of things. And the more chunky, understandable, digestible ideas. Yeah, right. Um Speaking about sort of Left for Dead, like that comes up in every conversation, right? It's it's Left for Dead, but it's in space. And, you know, Left for Dead is also the comparison point for every other four player co op shooter, which is definitely back in vogue, right? How do you feel about that as someone who's like responsible for Left for Dead? Do you like that? Is it a ghost that's following you around? Well, like... so, I mean, originally we were told, oh, well, in the trailer, you've got to say from one of the, you know, the, the, the lead of Left for Dead and all this on it. And if you notice, none of our trailers ever do that. Yeah. We're like, the game should stand on its own. Yep. And you should be buying the game because of what it is, not because of some heritage that you have perceived in it. A game like Love for Dead at Valve was made by a bunch of people. It wasn't just me. Yeah, of course. Um, I was project lead on Love for Dead 1 and 2. I lived with the game for a long time after that, including adding new modes and stuff to it. But like, Carrie Davis, one of the engineers, super valuable part of that process. Um you know, like, or Tom Leonard in leading of the Left 4 Dead 2 with me of the technical side of it, or, you know, like, there's so many people I could call out um, that just are this really big part of it. It's a big team that works in those games, right? And so I never wanted to have it be like, hey, I'm trying to take credit for this thing instead. And it's also, um, in the shorthand, when we were, there's a stage of the game where if you would have said Left 4 Dead Space, I'd have been like, yeah, that's what it is. But now we've taken it someplace different. It's more than that. And that was really the starting point of like, if we can build that, then we have the base to build on for the things that I know. Like I've lived with this game for a long time in this genre of game. I understand how players behave and how to approach new enemy types because we want to deal with how the players behave and get them to do some things. You know, one of the things is Love for Dead, the original was released 12 years ago, yeah, something like that. And players have just gotten better at playing these kind of games. They know about sticking together. They know about not lone wolfing it, right? And so you've got to change how you approach that and what you do there. And so, um, you know, I think it's a little tiring of just saying like that they're the same kind of game of like, look at GTFO. G GTFO, are you familiar with GTFO? Uh, that's actually my next question mentions that. So yes, <laughs> okay. yeah. So Ulf's a good friend of mine, the, mm -hmm. the, the CEO of uh, uh, 10, 10 Chambers. Chambers. Yeah. Uh, I know the whole team really well. That is a different beast. That is super hardcore, stealthy, make one mistake. And there's a lot of swearing and energy about yeah. it. That's cool. Yeah. That is cool. That is what, that's, that's what they're going for, right? And they've made something that's very distinct and different. We've made something that I think is very distinct and different. And it's kind of like, is every first person shooter the same? Are you saying that, you know, Thief is the same as Call of Duty? You know, I think there's a lot of flavor inside of there. I think what all these games are doing, though, is saying, hey, we've come to this point where if I'm going to go hang out with friends, especially during the pandemic, I mean, but also I just know friends that, that aren't all in one place. I rarely do I want to just sit here and just talk at a screen. I want to have a shared experience with them. And so yeah. what are those shared experiences I can have with them? And so there four players is about the right amount of people, I think. Five is too many three not enough especially when you get a stranger in and two that's a that's a lot of responsibility yeah. um so it's something in there right and so i think that's why there's this this influx of these games and my question's always been is why haven't people been making more of these before yeah right when i originally pitched these none of these i mean i knew i knew i knew what people were working on so i knew what things were coming from there's still some unannounced stuff but like yeah i'm just always surprised more people didn't make it make these kind of games yeah, it's kind of crazy, especially with, you know, the success of Left 4 Dead in those days. And then, like, no one really followed that up at the time. And then cool. uh, I think the argument was, oh, you got to get a group of four people together, fast forward, you know, five years, and then it's like 100-player Battle Royale jumping out yeah. of the sky, right? 
Um, well, but also I think people don't understand how big Left 4 Dead 2 was in particular. Mm. So if you looked at the numbers of like when Team Fortress 2 went free to play, the concurrent um, player count on TF2 was like probably five or six times of what Left 4 Dead 2 was. Yeah. But Left 4 Dead 2 had five times more monthly active users. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that's crazy. But it just didn't have that rabid, oh my God, I got to play this every day. And they're like just different kinds of games and different approaches. And so I think people just didn't understand of like how massive Left 4 Dead 2 was. I did. Um, <laughs> and, you know, wanted to go back into that world. And, you know, I, I were also worked on uh, Portal 2 co-op. Yeah. Like I just, I like co-op games. I like working together with people. I mean, partially it's maybe because I'm just bad at games and, you know, <laughs> but whatever. Yeah. Uh, okay. So this is kind of circling around this. So like, as you mentioned, the GTFO guys, when I interviewed them specifically, were like, uh, you know, Left 4 Dead is good and all, but I w we wanted a game that demands communication and you literally cannot do the game without communicating. Like yes. Left 4 Dead, you can lone wolf and still get through barely and not well, but you know, um, and then looking at something like Back for Blood, that obviously, you know, you know those people as well. Yep. That did very heavily say the successor to Left 4 Dead because Turtle Rock and everything. And all of my friends who are massive Left 4 Dead fans played Back for Blood for like a week and went back to Left 4, Left 4, uh, <laughs> Left 4 Dead 2. Too many fours in those, those names. Um, yes. But, you know, went back to Left 4 Dead 2 because it wasn't giving them what they wanted. Uh, and I feel like uh, playing the Anacrusas is definitely closer to that original feeling of it's this fun sort of world that's uh built around uh the controlled chaos in a way right well i mean like one of the one of the ways we think about it is like if we make a a non-depressing world <laughs> something um, unlike our real world right <laughs> yeah and have fun characters to hang out with you want to live in that world yeah now we may not have enough content for you yet but okay, you'll give it a try and you'll hang out with us because, okay, like it's not wearing me down. I think our game can be intense at times. And sometimes like I can't play a whole like five hours of it or something, but it's okay. <laughs> um, but it's not like, it's not like, uh, so when we originally conceived of this, you know, three years ago, I was looking around at all the um, post-apocalyptic games and they're so dreary and so dark and so just like serious mm -hmm. Not that I'm making a lighthearted post like post apocalyptic game, but um, yeah, I am right. Like I wanted to have that fun to it. I wanted to have that because it's to me, especially if you make. So our goal of our game is connecting people together. Yeah, so I think games cross boundaries in a way very few other things do. That when you have this experience together, um, the shared experience, and in these kind of games, you tend to be very close to each other. So you tend to see the same things or versions of the same things. Okay, you have this really clear, close experience. And the minute I can get you that group of four people who've never met before to laugh together, we won. Yeah. They're going to bond. They're going to hang out together. They're going to like try to figure out how to play more games together. And so that is the kind of thing we want to do. And I think you need to bring this world to it. Now, obviously launching early access. There's some parts that aren't complete for that yet here. There's some things in the matchmaking that doesn't help with this. We don't have a friend, uh, a game only friends list, which is something I'm a very big proponent of because it's weird that if I want to play a game with somebody on Steam, again, we have to become friends there, but I really don't want to know everything about them. I just want to know about this game. So we yeah. want to like bring, there's a whole bunch of more work we have to do here. So now we push everybody into the Discord, discord.gg slash straight on bay um, as a way to, do the stand in and learn. So we'll learn how people like to match. Like I think right now I want to go make a thing for discord to let you say, Hey, at 4 PM Pacific time, I want to play a game today. Yeah. Sign up. Yeah. Because we see a lot of this kind of like um, appointment based gaming mm -hmm. where people know like, Hey, I'm going to have a half hour here. And then it becomes like, okay, then we have to be clear of how much time each of these episodes tend to take now wildly different when you're learning them. But once you learn them, we have a better idea. Right. And so start affording people those kind of things. Cause then you could go hang out or you can go meet people. You can go meet strangers on our discord. Our discord is amazing. Like I love the people on there. I've been playing um, games with them for the past year and a half. Yeah. And like, they're a really nice group of people. Um, they're a better group of people than I am. Um, <laughs> like they teach me how to play games and that's just amazing. And yeah. so it's just like, how do we then bring that into the game off the discord? Because it can't just live in the discord because only a subset of the people will go into the discord. But for right now, when we're early, 
we can't. And that's why, uh, if you when you talk to GTFO and all, why they were, were brilliant for not having any matchmaking at first, because they just yeah. shoved everybody in the Discord to say, yeah. you got to have this conversation, because if you match with three randos, uh, you're going to have a really bad time. <laughs> yeah, like the West time. Yeah, and I always I hate I hate the word randos because it sounds pejorative. Yeah, but just three people you don't know who then you are later going to become lifelong friends with and marry one of them. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Uh, so let's talk about the non-depressing world of the Anacrusis, as you said. Uh, obviously, that seventies, sixties sci-fi vibe, uh, like definitely getting a lot of Kubrick, Star Wars kind of things. Um, but I was interested to hear in another interview that you actually based a lot of the characters off who's out in space right now. Yes. Um, so, yeah, can you talk a little well, bit about that for people who don't know about that and sort well, of how so, well, you're meshing that? Well, so there's, there's, there's two things going on there. One is um, in s some websites that want to be super angsty, edgy, right? Mm -hmm. There's some attack of the mix of our characters uh, as yeah, being course, some right. kind of social warrior thing. Yeah. But go, there's a website like who's in space right now. Go look at it. Guess what? <laughs> right. It's a mix of uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And females and a lot of different races. Yeah. Um, and so that's truly who's in space, not just this um, one centric view of Filling it. the quota kind of thing, which is something yes. I've heard a lot. And about. so, and so, you know, so a, I, I am a, it's weird. I'm a big fan of space, but I mean, like, my earliest memories are of um, stuff in the in the seven sixties and seventies of space, right? Mm -hmm. um, like I think the earliest memory I have is of the uh, a successful Apollo mission and my crazy neighbor across the street going off and setting off a giant rocket. And it's in the old <laughs> neighborhood, and I actually remembered it enough. So I'm like, okay, that was pre five, so it was like four. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, right. Like, and it's like I remember that, and I've always just been interested in really like things had an impact on me, like. Um, you know, the Columbia and Challenger disasters mm -hmm. really sat with me. And so some of some of the characters then we pull for their names on those kind of things so that they have like this historical grounding that most people probably do not know. But like, I'll do one for instance, um, Guillaume. Um, his official name is Guillaume Johnson Jr. The Guillaume is, comes from Guillaume Buford, which is the first African-American uh, in space. American, yeah, African-American in space. And the Lawrence Jr. was, there's an African-American astronaut that was supposed to be the first Af African-American in space, but instead he died in a um, crash as he was a test pilot as well, right? Uh, like, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you hear all about like three test pilots in the 60s and you think they were the only ones. Yeah. There were a lot of people risking their lives and they were a diverse group of people risking their lives doing stuff that we could learn, right? Mm -hmm. And so like we named the character after him. Don't want to hit you on the head with that. There's no reference of it in the game. It just exists there as these are the things I want to pull on as we're making the game and kind of run through. Um, yeah. Not everybody has this, not everybody has the same weight to their name, but they often have some kind of same grounding in it. Yeah. And again, that's just, that's just like, those are things that make me smile. I don't really care if anybody ever. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. That, that thing, you know, but I also wanted like interesting names because what do names look like in thousands of years from now? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Brad yeah. A name, the student yeah, name, the yeah, name. Like, exactly. I don't know. Right. Like, um, yeah, so I guess this is interesting. I wanted to ask you a bit about sort of um, your narrative perspective on a, on a game like this and, and Left 4 Dead, right? Like Portal feels like you can control that narrative drip flow as you're going through, right? Maybe less in the co-op sphere. Um, I feel like Left 4 Dead and, and the Anacrusis has a lot of that environmental storytelling and it's almost what's not said, but you're inferring from whether that's the location or like a great example is when you first get on the isolode. And you're like, oh, things are not right here. And then uh, one of my favorite parts in playing the early access build is when you come back and stuff is really messed up in there. Uh, and a lot of times, like I heard this in Back for Blood, it's like, oh, they're just reusing environments. But for me, this was a big part of what's happening in this world. Um, so yeah, how do you sort of uh, deal with this environmental storytelling rather than writing big chunks of lore and Bibles and stuff in the game? So one of the things, if we go back to Portal for a second, so for Portal 2, um, other people were working on the co-op, they were doing a fine job of it, but they, they had not done as much co-op, and they would have a long kind of setup mm -hmm. at the start of a mission. But the problem is, you would only hear that once, and you would never hear it again, and players would be talking, they'd be joking around with their friends. Yeah. So then when I took it over, I broke all of that up, and mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, we got to tell this three times to the players throughout the thing. Hopefully one of those times they weren't screwing around or whatever right <laughs> and that's kind of how we look at the story here because the other thing is in you know in left for dead um when you start an episode 
that little intro story mm -hmm. is almost always covering the same ground because we wanted to make sure everyone knew what was happening. Yeah. Now, right now, if you play the Anacrusis until probably next week, you're going to run into a bug that it doesn't tell you the canonical version of the story the yep. first time you play it. Yeah. Oh, that's fucking painful that that bug got I, through there. And do you know what? I looked up on the website and when I saw what the story was, I'm like, oh man, that's really cool. It gives so much more context. Uh, but yeah. so, so you're supposed to hear the canonical version the first time. Yeah. At mm -hmm. least. Um, and then after that, um, we just say, hey, we know players play this more than once and they don't need to keep hearing that. Instead, we can start exploring other things. So there's hundreds of little stories that talk about the character and there's their world or what's going on or the reference things. But I wanted to see if I could do a, something different. And the different thing here is often you'll be in mid-conversation when they start, because the start of the game is they're leaving the Anacrusis they're on a jump ship, they get to the ISO load and they're boarding off. So there's some time of they've been together on the jump ship. Yeah. And sometimes you'll be like mid, like there'll be an argument that's clearly like, this is the end of a 20 minute argument <laughs> and tensions are in a different place or people are just frustrated. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to see how much people would infer back the rest of those conversations or piece together. So we talk about, a, we talk about a character Boris that we never see who never talks to us, but we have a lot of characters talking about. Yeah. And like, what does that look like? And how can you build the story from there? And what do you think of that person over time as we give you some hints? And so it's funny because in the forums, somebody or in the Discord, somebody was like, oh, it just feels like there might be a bunch of plot holes. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, huh. <laughs> well, because I don't give you everything at once and you're never going to get everything the first playthrough. And it's not like there's some weird alternative time frame thing yeah I'm not trying to do anything weird that way it's just okay as the characters went through this they probably said all of this mm. during it but you're not gonna get their moment to moment of everything so we we break it up this way right and so then as they play it more they're like oh wait a minute but this character said this here and it counters that i'm like yes because you everyone's <laughs> got a personal point of view it's not always gonna be the same yeah um and so i don't know if that's gonna be successful or not yet uh mm -hmm. that it was broken to start a hurt that our ability to, to yeah. evaluate it some um, but even then, maybe it isn't. Maybe we need to, maybe I have this feeling that maybe we need to set the table a little bit at the beginning of the game so people coming in cold have some idea of what's going on, that there's this ship, the Anacrusis, that they're going to the Isolo, that there's a jump ship. And then some of the other conversations will make more sense. And so maybe we just need to do that. We were going to do that originally with the intro movie, like a little, yep, yep. but then instead we kind of leaned into the crazy 60s sci-fi Yeah kind of intro and i think i like that as uh, animator andrian made that and it's fun and I, I really like that as well so you may have to do, do something that you, you see once and then decide if you ever want to see again we've been trying to we're small teams we've been trying to steer away from doing things that don't appear in the game and mm -hmm. doing big cinematics but there might be like one little cinematic here we have to do to kind of set the table and you could go from the story there or i could be wrong and this is not a way people want to digest stories and it's gonna be totally horrible and no one will ever know what the fuck's going on but <laughs> But people are starting to piece it together, give me some hope. I think players are really smart and I think we don't give them enough credit for being able to piece together things. And I like mm -hmm. there's a lot of um there's a lot of comedy and video and like either like in even in TikTok or stuff where they don't they don't they'll often set up the joke and not even say the joke because you know the joke. Yeah. And you yeah. don't need the joke to laugh, like you know the punchline coming. And so I think. I think there's just a generation of people now who are able to kind of piece together story on the fly really intelligently and bring it together. And so I want to keep exploring that and seeing if we can do that in the game. Yeah, for what it's worth, uh, as, as you said, like people are always chatting, especially when they're jumping into a new game. So you, you tend to miss that stuff, but that never sort of occurred to us. It was just always, okay, we'll work this out as we go along. And like, on paper, what you're saying makes a lot of sense. And like when we jumped into it a second time, as you said, we started to piece those things together. And I think as players, right, when you get something that's new that you haven't seen before, it's a bit like, ah, I don't know what the hell's going on, right? Yes. So yeah, maybe we need, a little need, bit of that. We need something there. For, for sure, we need something there in the first time to set you up and send you on your way of understanding better. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, let's talk about Stray, Bombay, small team. Um, I want to know, like, Valve was very flat, very, from what you hear, you can kind of do whatever you like. Um, things don't get finished because people aren't interested in them or something. Like, how have you set up Stray Bombay as a place for people to thrive? Well, so th there's this weird thing around flat where um, people, like, try to have some dogma around it. 
Yeah. And I think even we fall into that here. Um, and that's actually something we've been talking about lately, where the real goal is just you want the people doing the work to be in charge of the work. Mm-hmm. Right. And so if Rob is tuning weapons, he doesn't need a designer on top of him telling him how to do that. He's already going to know that system. He's built that system. He's going to be tuning that system. Now he should get feedback from everybody and listen to everybody. But how do you let him have the most leeway there to explore or um, like Amy working on the director? Um, we have a what we call a difficulty working group that all talks about difficulty and then realizing that we shouldn't call it difficulty. We should call it intensity mm-hmm. and difficulties and kind of a, um, a product of intensity. Yeah. And but Amy owns that stuff. She owns that section. So in that case, like I respect her opinion when she says, Oh, here's the things we need to adjust. Here's how it's going to work. And like when we first went from the game, just being insanely hard to, Oh, Hey, it actually reacts to you and is more intelligent. Now it was really good. I think the thing though, now we found out is picking up with random people on the internet um, we have some communication tools that aren't being fully used because we had we had turned off um, voice by default to begin with because it was of we don't want people just jumping in the game and being yelled at and that kind of toxicity around. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Um, but equally, turning that on is an inconsistent experience for people. We don't have the messaging wheel that's coming. We don't have some other things. So what happens up happening is, end cap uh, enemies that can end cap you. Mm-hmm. have more power than they do if you have communication. Right, yeah, of course. And so now we realize we need to go back and adjust that. And so someone will bring that up and be like, hey, so p- people are reporting this is harder than we thought. And it's always this weird thing because you either set three skill levels and you go, okay, this is what the game's doing. We understand that. But if you're doing it adaptively, you have to go watch players. Yeah. And we watched a ton of players and we would be like, oh my God, that was an intense game we just had. No one's going to be able to do it. And then we'd bring in outside players who didn't know each other and they would be able to handle it, but their, their intensity would be way different. Right. Yeah. Um, and so like we thought the system had worked and then we realized, okay, now that we've gone to this next step, it's not, it's having some problems here. So now we need to make some adjustments to it. Right. And so that's Amy being able to take in that information, be able to listen to it and then come back and say, Hey, I think this is what's happening. I'm going to make some changes here. Yeah. And so I think that was really empowering at valve and then equally not pitching, pulling people into roles. So like the very first thing I ever did at Valve is I worked on the Day of Defeat website because I said, uh, hey, this website sucks. Yeah. <laughs> I really like Day of Defeat Source. So, so did I. That's my favorite uh, game back in those days. And we, yeah. still, we still play it in our Discord. Um, <laughs> but it was like that kind of thing of like letting people jump in when they think they can handle something or help with something and not just be um, this one group. Um, and I think we're so, it's harder with a smaller team because a lot of times you just need people to do some things and get it done. Yeah. Um, but so there's some flavor of that. There were different people stand up and kind of take over different things. And maybe they're going to run the retro or they've got some ideas of how we should do stand up or, um, like that kind of thing gets more spread out, more distributed. Um, it's a learning process. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, our, for our thing is like, we always just, so one of the good things I learned at Valve was, is. Every time there's a problem, look at it and go, okay, this is what everyone else is doing. Why are they doing that? Okay, are they doing that for the same reasons because they have the same problem we have or do we have a different problem or is there an opportunity here if we step back and think differently, Mm -hmm. right? And sometimes it's like, oh yeah, these people figured it out. They're right, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, oh, that's how they got there. Uh Yeah, that's a hard problem. I get why they did it that way. Um, But sometimes it's like, hey, let's, we can do something totally different here. And so like now we're in the realm of like, what can we do? Let's not have a name attached to it anymore. Mm-hmm. What can we do? Because we now have employees or, or people that work with us in Nor- Norway. Yeah. And we have people in Chicago and we have people or in Texas and Philadelphia. And like, how do you, you can't do it like a regular studio. And a lot of the tools now that you see trying to replicate that casual conversation in the studio they do it all if you're all synchronously there at the same time yeah but what if people's core hours are a little bit different and you have less overlap how do you do this yeah and i will tell you i don't know uh-huh. um we we talk about it my thing always is like just keep talking about it and we, we can try things but we need to be good about saying if something's not working we should stop doing it 
yeah now that is a challenge you know as someone who worked in australia most of their career everywhere else is like on a completely different time zone um it's a lot of hard work to create that sort of not even just workflow but a bit of company culture especially when your company's really starting out and you're all getting yep. to know each other and how to work well together so yeah it's definitely a curve but i do think you know the pandemic has come along just as you started this company which i'm sure was a big blow as it has been to everyone um but i do think the one positive of that is things like you're saying like oh we work with someone from norway now because that's just what we do people can yep. work from anywhere and i think it's opened us up to a lot of you know interesting opportunities in that respect um yes so stray bombay you already said that you're going to be working on this game for a long time in the future um can you give us a bit of a, a vibe of where what the next updates are going to be obviously you're right now in that bug squashing phase but you know season zero sitting there with nothing in it we know that quests are coming yep. so yeah have you got a bit of an idea of where we're going yeah so definitely there's there's a really <laughs> uh, horrendous bug right now where under some circumstances the wrong data center will be picked for the server and people will have a very bad experience that they won't equate to that being the underlying bug oh right yeah okay and that sucks because they'll yeah. be like the weapons feel really mushy there's the hit reactor like I'm like <sighs> that is already should go out tomorrow mm -hmm. um and then after that there's just you know we listen to the forums we listen to the bug reporting we have a zendesk thing set up that everyone can just send through um so i can we can see all of those and we kind of st stack rank those of like what are the important things like what are the things that are really killing people because right um, but behind the scenes, there's two ways to always think about these things. There is retention. What are people, what are bad things happening to people right now that make them not want to play the game anymore? And then there's user acquisition. What is a thing that we can add that someone's going to go, oh shit, I want to try that. Yeah. Right now we can't care about user acquisition. We have enough people playing the game. Mm -hmm. Game Pass has brought us a ton of players. Steam's done really well. So, okay. What we need to do now is fix the experience for people so that they have a reason to come back and keep playing. So that means some bug fixes. That means some things around um, dealing if there is some toxicity, um, because our thing is like, there should never be any of that because the best experience is when you can trust that you can jump in and, and have a good experience. Yeah. So any of that is something that becomes a high priority, even if it's not a thing that's dominating, right? Yeah. Um, I don't wanna misweight that. Um, and then it becomes things like, okay, like actual bugs, bugs, game stopping bugs, game breaking bugs, some lovable jank, you know, gets yeah. pushed down and become later. Uh, making sure communication gets elevated because being able to communicate, be the communication wheel or the voice stuff being more evident, um, those kind of things. And then the metagame coming in, which is, um, you know, if you bought the game, it's free, don't worry. Um, you can, um, it's just an engagement feature where you yep. can earn stuff in the game and it gives you little challenges to do and brings you back and you can get emotes and dances or dances and uh, custom outfits and stuff like that, right? Just kind of having yeah, some yeah, fun yeah. with it. Um, and so like, those are those are probably the big things coming, you know, then after that, it's looking at getting out the stuff for editor, for people in the modding community to be able to have access to modding. So we started modding with the community and we did not have the resources to put forward on that. So what we did was we just gave them access to our Perforce. <laughs> Uh, was that a bit uh, scary when that happened? <laughs> um, this is why when you're a small company, you should do a thing only a small company can do. Yeah, true, true. Valve cannot just give somebody yeah. their per force access for good reason. Like yeah. it would not be smart of them. But for the size of the company we are and the people we were inviting to do it, we're like, yeah, let's just do this. Yeah. Um, and it was totally the right move. That's awesome. That's really cool. Um, but now it's not the right move. And we need to get tools out to people so that they can not have to have our full depot. It's yeah. also a giant depot, right? Like it's, yeah, it's a weird move. All right. Yeah. But so like now we have somebody dedicated building those tools for that. Probably before those tools are even available, we'll give them a taste of one of the things being worked on. Um, Cause that's really, I think, cool and important to us that that kind of thing's happening. Um, and then it'll be, you know, we have episode four and five to come yet this year. We have uh, a new game mode. We have maybe new specials and weapons and, uh, and perks coming. Yep, yep. You know, one of the things that we knew when shipping is, um, the joke I always make is PUBG has an M16 and an AK-47 in it. 
They're the same mm-hmm. fucking weapon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're not. They're like they're different ammo or whatever, and they look different and whatever. But they're the same weapon. Yeah. Like, if you were a really limited team, you would just do one of them, not both of them. Yeah. And right now we've got our AK-47. We need to get our M16, and then we need. And I get that. I get that feel of like you want the thing that like this is the one that resonates with me. Whatever. I like the sound better. I like the feel of it. I like the look of it. So we need to get more variation in on those kind of things as well. Um, and then, yeah, I probably like balancing perks and like listening to those things, doing some of the uh, adjustments and actually probably playing with some of the weekly challenges a little bit. Like yep. what do people like the one now is interesting, um, but it's one that, yeah, it's the one now is scavenger hunt where you start with nothing and you have to find everything in the world. Um, there's some other ones coming, but also like what's chill mode look like where it's just a really chill game and very different and people can engage with and those allow us to explore some ideas and see what we can learn from those. Um, so, you know, it's that kind of update, but also it's not just like that kind of update in the sense of like, Oh yeah, we're just going to make more maps. And by the end of this, it's also like, we have somebody working on the hit reacts for the common enemy because we're going to add some more of those. We're fixing some of the animations and some of the specials. Like it's the whole broad spectrum of it. You know, I, a way I look at it as a game that I really liked that I thought just handled their early access or even private beta brilliantly was uh, Deep Rock Galactic. Yeah, for sure. Um, like the very first time I jumped into that game, I was like, what the hell? Uh, and <laughs> struggled a little bit, um, but kept coming back to it. And now it's something that we play as our community. We play it like at least once a month. Yeah. And it's got, a, it's really deep. It's got a lot of stuff going on in it. It's got a lot of... Um, not just complexity, but depth to it. Yeah, for sure. It's really interesting. And you could just see where they could, they reacted to how players were playing and, 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 you know, went with it. Um, And I think that's like a really good example of just kind of building out that way. And so that's where we are. There's just a lot coming. um, And we will be doing a, the idea is to do kind of a cadence of every two weeks. Yeah. Probably one really bug fixy and one more content Mm -hmm. focused. But early on right now, we just already have a set of bugs that like if we have a meeting at 11 a.m. tomorrow because today is officially a holiday. But um, we have a 11 a.m. tomorrow that's like, hey, let's submit this patch um, yeah. for cert because I think we're ready to go with this one. Yeah. 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 It is a holiday, so I won't keep you much longer. I just have a, a few more really quick questions. Um, Game Pass. Are you a fan and has it been super successful for you? Uh, what are your thoughts on it? So... A, my a fan. So, as a customer, uh-huh. years ago, I was like, "How do you not own Game Pass? Mm-hmm. It's amazing deal." Yeah, I still unreal, buy right? some games because I want to live with them longer, or just have them in my my library. But it's just an amazing deal. Yeah. So one of the early things as we thought of the company was like, either we can ignore what we like mm-hmm. and pretend that this isn't going to happen, or we can look <laughs> at this and go, "If we like this, I bet you other people like this." Yeah. And then it becomes, okay, how do we think about our game inside of that context? And, you know, part of me wishes that there were no costs to any of this. And we all just could make games and not yeah, have to worry right. about selling. The and all that. I just want people to play the things I make. Yeah. And Game Pass is just this great opportunity to put your game in front of a bunch of players and get a bunch of feedback. Yeah. It will be interesting as we're actually officially in Game Pass preview, which is like this weird, their early access. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. And so will people keep coming back? Will they keep trying it? But right now, like the friction for them trying it is really low. So we hope as we keep updating and they keep trying it, they can keep coming back and keep engaging and playing. Um, And I apologize that they're suffering on that server selection issue the most probably. So um, we will soon, soon, very soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Um, I do have to ask, uh, what black magic are you working on your networking? Because... I was playing like every time I haven't been able to play left for dead for three years since I moved to Japan because it's impossible. Cause all my friends are in Australia or the States. Right. And first out of the shop at a Crucis match with someone in Malaysia, someone in Canberra, Australia, uh, someone in New York city and Tokyo, no dramas. Like, how are you doing that? Um, first the engineers made really smart choices along the way. Yep. <laughs> Um, you know, one of the things is we've kind of made a rule of not cracking open Unreal and trying to modify it too much. Instead, let's just say, let's, there's, 
it's always like you can make this change, you can make this change. If you're making a game, you can do these things. Why don't we just do the things that don't make us have to crack open the engine so that we can not have to worry about that and that complexity. Then we're working with a company called Excel Byte, which is kind of our middleware that helps with some of the matchmaking and some of the kind of the user account stuff. And then it's just AWS servers and the internet's gotten fast, right? Yep. And I think one of the things we look at as we go and go, okay, um, in that part of the world, we, we do have a, we do have a, a large player base. How can we help serve them better? Should we be putting servers over there? AWS makes it really easy mm -hmm. to click a button and say, let's spin up some servers there. How our game works. It does a really nice job of kind of sitting in the background and going, oh, I have, I have some, there's some people who want to play it. Let's me spin them up. And then it's like, should we relinquish the server or should we keep using it? Uh, oh, wait, someone else wants to play. Okay. Let's just keep it alive and yeah. go. And so that's just been really successful. I think on that part of it. Which is, drives me nuts then when we have the bad part of it. Yeah, like, yeah, because right. I'm like, ah, oh, everything else works right. That said, I think there's even more stuff we want to do there, as well as more ways of um, kind of trying to help people with that. So be it either um, private lobbies, so that you can just have your small group, and then you're going to be worth wherever you want, and you don't have to worry about it. To you know, are there other are there other ways people want to play the game that we should be helping them do it, or is there additional? data centers we should be helping spread around. And you know, some of that's talking to our partners, some of that's talking to our investors, and some of that's just talking to players. Um, yeah. And so we had to start somewhere. This is where we started. And then uh, yeah, we'll grow from there. Yeah, but that's awesome. awesome that you had a good experience. Yeah, I yeah. I was, I, we were incredibly surprised, especially like early access. And we're pretty forgiving when games first come out, because that's when yeah. you have the server issue. So we were like, oh, wow, it's just working. Well, you, well, you know what kills Left 4 Dead normally is the loading of the nav mesh. Ah, oh, right, right. Yeah. That's what times out people because this is big, bulky, yeah, problematic thing. And so, so many times when we try to play, um, local, like we will play in our Discord, we play um, co op games one day mm -hmm. and mods the other. And Love for Dead's one of those that often yeah. is both. Um, and often when someone can't connect, you can go look at the logs, it's still loading right. in the nav mesh. Yeah, right. Um, so you know, being a game developer myself, um, being on the pro you know production and and publishing side and i think it's really important for developers and you kind of mentioned this earlier like mon monetary goals is like a necessity but isn't necessarily the sign of a successful game um so with this first early access release do you do you personally feel that the edit crucis has been successful for for you and your team well we're only three days out yeah so, so far <laughs> um we we looked at it as what what are the number of players that we have wanted to have touched the game by the end of the month and yep. we're well above like we're probably going to pass that this week already yeah awesome so in that that case super successful yeah um but it's weird though because people just look at the steam numbers and have no idea the amount of um game pass players that mm. are playing with and that are a huge impact right uh and we like we like both that's why we do cross play um yep. And so then it becomes the interesting thing of is, okay, out of this group of players that are playing, you know, where are they coming from? Like, so here, I'll, I'll use just a little behind the scenes, really practical stuff that you have to do in game development. Yeah. The game is not localized um, to Japanese language. Mm -hmm. Talking to a lot of different people. Mm -hmm. And we also don't have a publisher in Korea. These are two tied together. Yeah. Of both, in both instances, people said, release the game first and see. Yeah. If you see it spark there, then you can make, then you could, then you could buy that additional cost and then do the work there. Yeah. Um, or work with a publisher in Korea and then like you first see if there's interest, right? Yeah. And it's yeah. always that different regions have different set of stuff. I mean, God knows for Valve, I went over to Korea when um CSO2 online launched, right? Mm. And that was not ever really popular in the States, but man, is that popular in Korea? Yeah, right, right. Right. And so it's just like you gotta just do that. And so then like that's some of the stuff that we'll be looking at this coming week and planning for, but you actually won't see the outcome of that because it's that classic. Okay. Let's say it's super popular in Japan. Our turnaround time to get that localized and put in the game is still going to be three weeks yeah. a month. Like, yeah. And that's just the reality of what that looks like. And so then it's like, okay. And then like, you know, I can see the people being like, why won't you listen to us? We want this game. And I'd be like, well, yeah, we want to get it there, but here, here's the reality mm -hmm. of it. And so um, get for like all of that, just we're, we're trying things, we're seeing the reaction and going from there. And so far the reaction has been really great. Yeah. Awesome. Great. All right. Well, I want to thank you for taking the time to have a chat with us. Um, if you want to plug any of your stuff here at the end, uh, your discord and all that, uh, we can go ahead and do that. But uh, I urge everyone watching this video to make sure you go check out the Anacrucis.
yeah, so uh, you can get the Anacrusis um, on Steam or Game Pass, um, PC or Xbox. And then um, if you go to discord.gg slash stray Bombay, so stray Bombay is our company name. Bombay is a breed of cats. My cats are strays. Awesome. Um, <laughs> and so Boris, my cat is the logo. Um, but just discord.gg slash stray Bombay is probably the best place that you can meet other people playing the game. You can, um, there's hookups there. So we use, so one of the things, so in that community, we play um, games every week. And in fact, next tomorrow, we're going to play um, uh, Double Action Boogaloo. Oh, nice. We're just doing that. We're, we're just not going to play our games. We're going to play yeah. all these other games as well. But with that, we learned some things about how do you match people together mm-hmm. on these games that don't have good matchmaking or other systems, or you're not on Friends, or you're on different platforms. And one of them is um, Party Codes. And so all you have to do is if you want to play the game with some people that you know are chill and cool and want to hang out, is you go to Discord.gg. You go into the looking for a game and post your party code and say, hey, I'm looking for a game. Join me and people will join up. You can go sit in our Discord and use that or you can use the in-game voice. Thanks for watching, everyone, and I hope that you enjoyed this interview. If you want to see more of this type of content, I'd really appreciate it if you could check it out Patreon. Every single month, Pixels for Breakfast releases podcasts and videos, and in 2022, I want to hone in on what really interests me personally. The relationship between player and creator, the developers and how they get their ideas, and the stories that go into releasing these games that we all love so very much. And if that sounds like the type of content that you'd like to support, every single dollar really does help. So thank you for watching. And as always, don't forget to pixelate your breakfast.